Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Wolfram. I'm the laboratory manager of Riverbank Acoustical Laboratories. Um, thank you for joining us today on our uh, webinar series. Um, today, we're going to discuss um, acoustical product testing, um, basically the laboratory and field test methods. This will be kind of a, a bird's eye overview of the different test methods that we use and also the mathematics behind them. Don't worry, we don't go too deep into the technical side of things. So some of the uh, more technical people on the call will, will already know much of what I'm saying, but um, we'll kind of go through the differences and the rationale when it's appropriate to use lab tests versus when it's appropriate to use field tests and then a, an example. All right, so let's start with some terminology, and I promise all these slides aren't going to be full of uh, text and equations, but I think it's important that we get um, we get on the same grounding regarding some of these terms, um, because you'll notice in the field of architectural acoustics and acoustical products, sometimes these ter terms are used incorrectly or interchangeably, um, and we'd like to set the record uh, straight. So first, sound transmission loss. When we say sound transmission loss, we um, are referring to the ability of a flat wall, door, um, window, or panel to block sound from transmitting from the source room to the receive room in a laboratory environment. So specifically, um, it's the difference in the sound level between the source and receive room adjusted for the sample and aperture area of, and the quantity of sound absorption in the receive room. So this term used like this, it, it's referring to a laboratory test result. Um, the definitions here are coming from both the ASTM E90 standard, which is published by ASTM International, as well, um, which is the ASTM E90 is the test method for sound transmission loss in a laboratory and then ASTM also has a standard of term, uh, terminology um, which has been recently updated as well and this um, basically lists a lot of these acoustics terms. Um, ASTM International is um, an international organization that collaborates and publishes standards that are used by laboratories and consultants so that we're we're basically doing things the same way. Um, the group that um, collaborates on these is called the ASM E33 committee. And actually that committee is open to membership from manufacturers, consultants, even um, homeowners or consumers are welcome to participate in the committee. So uh, back to the terms. Uh, sound transmission loss, um, we said was the laboratory method for the effectiveness of a panel or door to act as a barrier for sound transmitting through it. This term sound absorption um, has a specific meaning in the acoustical products arena or building acoustics. When we use this term as acoustical engineers, we're typically describing the ability of the material to reduce the reverberation time or sound reflections within a room. So it's the process by which these materials receive that energy and turn it into heat through a, basically a process of friction. So typically sound transmission loss is used for barriers and sound absorption is used for materials that improve the quality of sound within a room. Now there are lots of have uh, lots of um, counter examples to that. You may use sound absorption within a wall assembly to reduce the cavity resonance, which could improve transmission loss. But for the most part, we consider those as separate properties or separate categories even of materials. So the classification or rating for sound transmission loss is STC. You may have seen this commonly, the sound transmission class. So this is a single number rating, which is calculated in a very specific way according to ASTM E413 using the transmission loss values tested according to ASTM E90. So one important thing to take away from this presentation is that STC, 
since it's calculated from lab test results, STC is specifically a lab rating. Um, another common classification or rating that you'll see is the noise reduction coefficient, or NRC, and this is the single number rating for sound absorption. Um, and this is defined, both the classification and the test procedure are defined by this ASTM C423. I should mention as well that um, if you have questions as we go, please uh, put them in the chat. Um, Becca is acting as the moderator and she'll read those out to, out to the group as we go. And feel free to ask any, any questions you have. So what you see here is a very old rendering of our laboratory from circa 1923. Um, which was published in Scientific American. And it really demonstrates how much goes into the construction of a laboratory environment. Um, the reason that we do tests of materials in a lab is that we have control over all the influences or um, items that may interfere or influence the results of the test. We control all these um, variables. And then the difference in results from test to test can be attributed to the specific product that's under test. So labs are buildings that are, in, in, in the case of acoustical products, labs are buildings or rooms that are specifically designed to test these products. So for example, the ASTM C423 test method uses a um, variation of the Wallace-Sabin equation and we test, we determine the sound absorption of a product by testing the rate of sound decay in a reverberation chamber and the using the calculation with the volume of the reverberation chamber and the speed of sound in the room. Um, and the method of determining the speed of sound is also uh, defined in the standard. Um, we're able to determine the sound absorption, the Sabins, of the product. So in the case of um, in this method, we are determining the total absorption added to the room by the sample by determining the sound absorption in the empty chamber and then the sound absorption when the specimen has been installed. And the difference for those is attributed to the specimen. And that's a very, very simplified explanation of the ASTM C423 method for determining sound absorption, which gives the NRC rating that you may see very commonly used in marketing and specifications. Also provides the sound absorption average, which is an updated, modernized variation of NRC. So if we have a flat product or panel um, for ASTM C423, we can determine something called sound absorption coefficients. The name is a uh, that's a mis a little bit of a misnomer. Really, it's Sabin's per square foot, but we use this term sound absorption coefficient, which is the total absorption measured divided by the area of the sample, so the Sabin's per square foot. Now, for transmission loss testing, we follow standard ASTM E90, and we're determined. We basically have two of those reverberation chambers that are connected by an aperture. We measure the average of the sound level in the source room. So that's averaged both over time and spatially using a rotating boom, uh, minus the average in the received room with a correction or standardization, um, which is 10 times the log of the area of the test sample divided by the units of sound absorption in the receive room. So transmission loss, sound transmission loss, has a correction for both the size of the sample and the, sound, the quantity of sound absorption in the receive room. This is important to note with sound transmission loss. So ideally, if the product was tested at any size, 
you would have the same sound transmission loss values. And since the presence of absorption in the receive room is corrected for, it the result is would be the same regardless of how much of absorption is in the receive room or what the receive room is. So this sound transmission loss has these corrections inherent to it. And remember that STC, the sound transmission class rating, is calculated from transmission loss. So it therefore also has these um, corrections applied to it. Right here is a floor plan of our transmission loss facility, which shows the nature of the construction of the chambers. So in an example where we have a wall assembly tested in the large opening, we have a source room which is isolated from the building structure as well as from the receive chamber. So this, in this example, the receive room is room two. Um, so sound is created using a loudspeaker in the source room and measured averaged over time and spatially in the source room, and then also measured in the receive room in the same way. That gives these first two properties. Then we also measure the decay times similarly, not exactly, but similarly to that ASTM C423 method. Um, we measure the decay times and the presence of sound absorption in the receive room, um, and that correction is applied. We're controlling in this laboratory environment, we're controlling the temperature, we're controlling the humidity. We try to maintain constant temperature and humidity in these spaces. Um, and then the nature and construction of the chambers is such that all of these other paths, sound transmits more weakly through all of these other paths than it does through the sample by a significant enough margin that we have confidence that all or most of the energy that we're measuring in the receive room is coming through the opening. Um, and that's why we can use this correction for the area of the sample. I'll quick go over this classification, the single number rating. So in this example here, the red line is the transmission loss value. So this is um, the output of that ASTM E90 test, these values of transmission loss at one third octave bands. You see that the actual performance is sort of messy. Sometimes it's a nice linear curve. If you have a homogeneous limp type of material, you may see it like almost a straight line. If you have materials that have resonances to them, you may see significant dips. Or if you have certain types of materials, you may see coincidence dips up here in the high frequencies. Because of the complexity of this, um, it's, it was found to be much easier for communicating to the general public if this could be distilled down into a single number. Because the transmission loss always, not always, but typically follows this rising curve, an average isn't really appropriate. And so many years ago, the ASTM committee, E33 committee, developed this um, method of fitting a standard reference contour to the actual transmission loss data. And that's done by increasing, so the, the shape of this curve is defined by ASTM E413, and they increase the curve until neither of two criteria are exceeded. So one, um, that a maximum of 32 deficiencies overall is not exceeded, and by deficiencies, we mean points where the red line is below the blue. So you can't have more than 32 total. And you also can't have more than eight um, deficiencies in any single band. So you can't exceed eight in any band. You can't exceed 32. The highest that the blue line can be without violating either of those two rules, the STC rating is the value of that blue line at 500 hertz. So that's how it's calculated. There is only one way to do it, um, and and that's that. So we do we'll have one question. Oh, sure, go ahead. Came in. Um, if I want a 0.75 NRC, but are using clouds and not going wall to wall with my ceilings, 
Do I take the volume of the space and divide by my desired NRC of 0.75? That would give me the foot Sabin's coverage I would need. Good right? question. That's a hot topic at the moment. And we actually have an entire webinar dedicated to that exact question. Um, if you go to uh, riverbankacoustics.com, there's an education tab and then scroll down um, and you'll see a link to the YouTube video for that, um, that topic. I'll give you a brief short answer to it. Um, the Sabins, in that case, so when we test that product, right, we measure or we calculate from measurements a total quantity of Sabins added by that array of objects and currently the correct way to present those results is Sabins per object, Sabins overall and Sabins per object. So if you had eight objects, you divide by eight, the overall divide by eight. This question of NRC, remember NRC is calculated from sound absorption coefficients. Um, and those coefficients are actually defined as Sabins per square foot. The Sabins per square, the per square foot there is undefined currently. There is a ballot at ASTM right now to add a new array NRC or array SAA rating. Um, and I think that ballot closes today. So you may within a year have a legitimate way to calculate NRC for, for space objects. But like I said, check out that, um, that webinar. We go through, there's at least three, maybe four different possible interpretations of how to do that. So. Um, we have another one. What sure. about CAC? How can we measure it? Um, did they, I'm sorry, did you say CAC? Yeah. Yeah, CAC is a rating, it's a complementary rating for ceiling tiles. You, you typically see like acoustical ceiling tiles have both an NRC and a CAC rating. S NRC, remember, is the ability of the, the tile to reduce reverberation within the room that it's installed. CAC is the ability of the tile to block sound from going up and over an incomplete partition. So let's say you have two offices next to each other um, that um, have a shared plenum and a wall that does not go all the way up. Acousticians hate this, this configuration, but it's, it's done, I think, my understanding is that it's done for HVAC so you can have a shared plenum across the space. Um, but you have a path for sound up and over that wall. CAC um, measures the ability of ceiling tiles to block that. Um, we, Riverbank, does not currently have a set of chambers built in that way um, to test that, but we are planning to build something like that in the near future, so stay tuned. All right, we just got um, another question. Uh, decibel levels and STC rating are directly related, question mark. 50 STC stops 50 decibels, correct? Removing all flanking paths. Mm -hmm. So that that's a good question. And it's, there are some, um, some questions in acoustics that depending on your level of understanding can be very simple and can get extremely complicated. So I will answer it in, in the simple way first and then the complicated way second. So in the most basic broad brush understanding, that's approximately true. So the sound transmission loss through the wall is very approximately the number of decibels of sound attenuated as it flows through that wall. So very, very approximately, if you have a 100 decibel sound source on the source side and your wall has 60 decibels of transmission loss, then you will get approximately 40 on the other side. However, the reason 
and I have, the acousticians are already, I can hear them rustling on the other side of their screens because um, that's not actually true. That's not how it's calculated, but it's a really good kind of first understanding of what's happening. Um, similarly with absorption coefficients, you'll hear um, an explanation that absorption coefficients are the percentage of sound absorbed. In fact, they even teach this in introductory acoustics classes in college, that it, you know a 1.0 absorption coefficient is like 100% absorption. It's actually approximately true, but it's not actually true. It's not the definition. It's not how it's calculated. It's not what's really happening. Really, absorption coefficients are the Sabin's per square foot measured in a C423 test. So, and a Sabin was originally believed to be one square foot of sound absorption. So if you had one square foot of absorption per square foot of material, that would be ideal. However, today our current understanding of a Sabin is that it's not, that's not actually how it's defined. A Sabin is defined by the Wallace-Sabin equation. Um, okay, and so with transmission loss, it is, at any frequency band, now we're gonna get into a little bit more complicated, the mid-level understanding of, of your question. So the average sound level in the source room minus the average sound level in the receive room is the decibels of attenuation, but that value is then corrected for the aperture size and presence of sound absorption. So depending on the acoustic environment in the received side, you may see more or less um, attenuation. This is they attempted to be corrected for by the equation. Second, the overall STC has been influenced by this curve fitting algorithm. So it's not, it's weighting, you see it's weighting the higher frequencies more heavily and not exactly the way like type A weighting does. So it's not exactly what's happening, but it's a really good approximation. Okay, so we covered lab testing. We covered the ways that labs control their environment. They have very specific calculations um, to get a, a, a procedure that allows you to test materials. So field testing is also very important. Um, however, as illustrated by these photos, you have not ideal environments almost all of the time. So uh, in the field testing, you're really looking to kind of evaluate an existing condition. We'll, we'll kind of cover here the different methods. So these are defined by ASTM E336. So ASTM E336 is the procedure, the standardized, internationally standardized procedure for measuring something like STC, but in the field. So um, many of you have heard of something called a field STC. A lot of the consultants for the through the years have used that term, field STC. So field STC is a term that was defined by previous versions of ASTM E336, and it was defined for a very specific circumstance. So basically the walls, so we'll go back to our drawing here. So imagine a field environment. Um, so in the field you have, and we'll cover this later, all these possible flanking paths, but what if you shielded the walls, floor, and ceiling in the, the source room and receive room to try to eliminate those and then <coughs> oh, sorry, measure transmission <coughs> loss in the field? Um, that's how field STC was defined. Um, I remember um, we were in the task group for that standard and the leader of the task group asked, has anyone ever heard of anyone ever doing this? 
and nobody raised their hand. Not only had they not done it, but they had never heard of anyone building enclosures within the environments in the source room and receive room to block all the flanking paths to make that measurement. So it was determined that they were going to drop field STC. So currently field STC is not defined. The, the correct um, term um, is a parent sound transmission class defined by E336. Um, and what this is, is taking the same mathematics or similar mathematics and methodology from the lab and just transplanting it into the field. So you'll notice from that previous equation or previous slide on E90, the math is basically the same. So you're taking the source room minus the receive room and correcting it for the presence of sound absorption in the receive room and for the partition area common to both rooms. So this is a parent STC. Um, now there's some problems with this, some challenges. So first, um, it's only defined for very specific uh, minimum, maximum air volumes and rooms, which are rarely, not rarely, but very often are not what's present in, in the test environments. Um, two, sometimes this area part of the partition common to both rooms is difficult to determine. So maybe the rooms aren't lined up perfectly or they have a partial overlap <coughs> or whoever, um, maybe someone not thoroughly trained in the test might think they're testing just the door and might use just the area of the door um, mistakenly, that sort of thing. So this area of the partition isn't as clearly defined in the field as it is in the lab, or sometimes is not. Um, second, the or third, this, this value of the sound absorption present in the receive room is obtained using um, interrupted noise decays currently. Now I know they're, they're trying to change that to uh, impulse response in future versions, but even then this reverberation time method of determining the effects of the room or correcting for the effects of the room, that makes a lot of sense in reverb chambers, but it does not make sense in low decay time type environments, especially modal type of environment. So, so the math, like I said, it's been brought over from the lab tests. It's not, doesn't exactly work the way we want it to in the field sometimes. So, so this is the attempt to make sound transmission loss and STC happen in the field. But I think the movement now is to go away from that towards the two other ratings that are defined by E336. This one is my preferred approach, which is noise reduction and NIC. So basically we take the average sound levels in the source room minus the average sound levels in the receive room and make no attempt to correct for the aperture size, the shared partition area, or um, the room effects or sound absorption in the receive room. This would be, um, the, the level of noise reduction between the two spaces. From this, we can use the same classification method of E413 that's used for STC, that, that standard curve fit 32 deficiencies or eight, um, and obtain something called a noise isolation class or NIC. Um, the great benefit of NIC is that it can be uh, determined in almost any type of environment. In fact, you don't even need a source in a receive room. You could measure NIC down the hallway. Um, so for writing specifications and requirements for field testing, it makes a lot of sense to have the NIC rating specified because it can actually be obtained in almost any environment. And because the noise reduction values are the actual noise reduction experienced by the um, uh, occupants. So for example, if you have hardwood floors and a very Spartan uh, type of room um, furnishing, you may have just a little bit of a boost from those reflections. 
versus if you had um, a lot of carpets and draperies and furniture, padded furniture, there may be a little bit of an absorption in that receive room, which may have the effect of boosting NIC slightly. But um, like I said, if if that's the actual um, perceived uh, noise reduction, if that's the actual perceived level of sound insulation, then so be it. So, but there are some there's a criticism to this that well it provides an opportunity for gaming potentially, although I've never seen that. Um, or like I said, you if you tested um, condo condominium before it was furnished, the result might be slightly worse than if you tested it again after it had been furnished. So the current um, international building code is using this third approach, which is maybe a little bit of a compromise between the two. <coughs> so this is the normalized noise reduction or NNR, um, which is basically the noise reduction, remember source level minus receive level, which is attempting to correct for the reverberation time. So not converting it to sound absorption, but saying, um, trying to determine what would the noise reduction be if the reverb time was actually 0.5 or half second and then from this you cal calculate the normalized noise isolation class the nnic and that is the single number rating for a field test that's been um, measured in this way um, it's the current defined requirement for field testing in the international building code um, but the standard does re define requirements for the minimum and maximum cubic air volumes. There's situations where this can't be obtained, where basically those tend to be situations where the decay times um, are so w wildly different from this that this correction is invalid. Okay, we have a couple of questions. <laughs> okay, go ahead. How does this compare to the new standard for noise isolating pods? Yeah, so, well, there, there's similarities. So the um, the new center you're referring to is the ISO method. Um, I think it's two three three five one. Sorry, it's we're we're just started doing that within the last year. Um, that method is actually done very differently. So the, it, with the ISO method for pods is basically determining the sound power of a omnidirectional source like think of a dodecahedron speaker determining the sound power of that in a reverberation room without the enclosure then with the enclosure and then the difference between those two sound power levels at one third octave bands is used in some calculations to determine the speech privacy it's a very clever approach. It solves some of the problems of, you know, having the inside of a enclosure be a source room being so small and strangely, a strange, poorly behaving acoustic environment inside the booth. Um, but yeah, there's it's there's similarities. Um, I think they're working on a field version of that as well. So yeah, some of the same field versus lab um, challenges might be present there. Um, when you try to test pods in the field, the acoustic environment of the field environment can heavily influence the results, sometimes favorably. So that's a challenge. Um, the challenge in the lab is some of these pods are so large that they consume a lot of the lab volume or they're difficult to install, et cetera. So. So one major challenge that we have in the field are these flanking pads. Many of you know about this. And it's, um, it's basically this idea that your intended sound path, which in this, this drawing here is D, like you think you're testing D. You want to be testing D, but you're actually testing D and F and G and B and C and all of these paths that sound is taking from the source room to the receive room. Um, it's actually for a lab, it's very difficult to build a lab that has a very high level of sound insulation so that it's preventing flanking paths. And that in, in situation is very rarely present in the field unless you have something like a low performing door 
um, operable door and a high performing wall, flanking pads are part of your um, part of what you're testing. You're testing both the intended and unintended pads. So in this example here, we have a floor ceiling assembly, um, and I where you're you're testing your we're testing impact sound transmission of the floor ceiling assembly, but if there is a conduit or a duct or a path or a mullion where that airborne sound could get around the floor, you could have a very high performing floor ceiling assembly, but the sound that's coming through to the analyzer is through this unintended flanking path. Wait, we have. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, can you can I calculate TL for specific all mathematically? Oh, like, like making predictions on material performance. Um, yeah, and that's part of the work that acoustical consultants or acoustical engineers will do because they may not have data for everything. Um, they may make predictions about the material performance. In my experience, those, you know, we have people come into our lab all the time having made predictions. In my experience, if they've made those predictions based on previous tests, they're more likely to make an accurate prediction. If they've made those predictions based on like an analytical model of materials, there may be some surprises. Um, so, but that's a useful tool. So um, I think in the world of acoustical materials, you're predicting and testing and in the foreseeable future, testing isn't going away. In fact, I think testing is becoming more important. So going back to the flanking pads, um, so what's the difference or when do we use lab tests and when do we use field tests? Well, because you have no, you have very little confidence that you're measuring only this floor ceiling assembly, if your goal was to determine the sound insulation or impact sound um, transmission of just the floor ceiling assembly, then the field is the wrong place to do that. So a lab is the place to test products or systems before the sale. So where in the lab you can isolate only the product under test. But Field actually has a lot of validity to it. Field is how you evaluate the entire building or structure after the sale of the product or after the installation of the system or the assembly of the whole. So think of it this way, a field test tests a building or the relationship of sound between two rooms in a building and the lab tests the products. It's not possible to isolate just the products in a field test typically. Um, and this, so this can be a point of stress for product manufacturers. Like many of them will tell you tales of, you know, their customer bought an STC 50 door and installed it in a wood frame, single layer, lightweight gypsum. And that wasn't a wall that, you know, wood stud 16 on center, no insulation. It was a wall that wasn't an STC 50 wall. They hired a consultant to do a field test and didn't get an NIC 50 or didn't get an NIC 50. So, but it wasn't just the door that was being tested. It was the whole relationship between those two rooms. So again, lab tests products, field tests for buildings or structures. Oh, Field tests validate the, the, the whole. Okay, so this is a really great example of you know something that I think our um, executive branch has actually done a good job of. <laughs> so some of you have heard of something called a SCIF, and that stands for Sensitive Compartmented Information Facility. So this is a specific environment that has been designed to allow conversations with uh, classified information to take place um, and have that be inaudible outside of that environment. It's basically a standard for speech privacy for environments with um, where classified information is being processed. 
So these are becoming more common. Um, famously, a um, previous president had a uh, skiff built in um, in one of uh, his resorts and was conducting a lot of uh, business in that in that environment because it was certified um, for uh, as a skiff basically. So the standard for this um, is ICD ICS 705. The current version is 1.5, and it's published by the National Counterintelligence and Security Center. And the definition of counterintelligence is the ability, um, pr basically protecting um, an agency's information from an opposing agency's intelligence service or espionage, sabotage, etc. So what does it say about um, speech privacy and acoustic protection? Um, by the way, in this standard, there are requirements for um, radio frequencies um, attenuation as well. But one of the key uh, points is the acoustic protection. So in cases where they want to achieve satisfactory speech privacy for top secret information, U.S. government has defined two levels of this. So, um, and they've used the sound transmission class, the STC ratings, to define these requirements. So, um, so basically, at sound group three, they have a requirement, a design requirement of STC 45, and that means that loud speech within the skiff can be faintly heard, but not understood outside the skiff, and that normal speech is unintelligible with an unaided human ear. And then the next level higher is STC 50, and their definition, um, very loud sounds within the skiff, um, such as loud singing, um, brass music or radio, can be heard with the human ear faintly or not at all outside the skiff. Well, we could debate those, defi those, those definitions of STC 50 and 45, but generally I think the acoustics community agrees that 50 is a good target for speech privacy. Um, STC 50. So <clears throat> what they mean in this standard is that the wall assemblies, the doors, the floor ceiling assemblies, the other paths enveloping the skiff should be designed to these requirements. If their target is, ST, is sound group four, they need to be selecting an STC 50 door, STC 50 wall assembly, and if they're smart, frankly, they'll exceed that. Um, so the STC ratings are design guides, so for the selection of products and materials. This is not a field, it's not, STC cannot be obtained in the field, as we said before. STC is product tests, basically. These, these products have achieved STC 50 in a lab before they are purchased to be put into the SCIF. Now, smartly, they also require field testing. And the field tests are defined oops, in a couple of ways. There's a couple options. In my experience, and it might be some selection bias, people are calling me when they need the instrumented tests. But in my experience, the in instrumented tests are the most common approach um, because it takes decision out of the um, takes a decision out of the equation. They basically pass or fail based on this standardized test procedure. So they've defined a couple a little extra requirements during the tests, but for the most part, the instrumented test may be performed to noise isolation class NIC standards, and the results shall comply with NIC 40 for sound group three or 45 for sound group four. So this means ASTM E336, um, the NIC method, the NR and NIC method. So again, sound average sound level on the source side minus the received side, and then applying the um, classification contour to the, to the spectrum of results. Um, now you'll notice that they give a little bit See, for sound group four, you design to STC 50, but they have to pass a field test of 45. Many in the acoustics 
um, trade will recognize that right away. That is the very common industry standard five point acceptance of flanking from a lab test to a field test. So you, you have a kind of a five point uh, grace period, or I don't know what the right word for it is, a, a five point flexibility um, from lab to field with expectation that flanking pads are going to contribute a little bit or that'll be hard to um, mitigate or that, that the, the field is just harder to achieve the same level of performance. Um, so for a product manufacturer, you, you, you might be tempted to say, well, we should go for a field test because we have a five, we have a five point less uh, lower requirement. It's harder, it can be harder to achieve a 45 in the field sometimes than a 50 in the lab, depending on what the system is. So, but they're requiring both typically in my experience, or it's up to the administrative officer of the SCIF um, to require a field test and it's becoming more common. Um, and then they have the option of doing a, basically a listening test where um, output, it includes like normal speech played at a loud level and they'll evaluate speech intelligibility that way. That's an option for the SCIF as well. We have a question. Sure. Um, what side of the wall does the RC channel go? I was told it was installed on the loud side of the wall. Um, in the lab or in the field? Well, so that's a good question. There's probably some different considerations there depending on the environment. In the lab, we're typically putting the acoustic treatment, um, isolation treatment, et cetera. We typically put it on the source side in the test. The lab reports will identify that. They'll say which side it was placed on. It really depends on the product or system, but in my experience, it doesn't matter as much as people think which side the RC is placed on. There may be a little bit of a different performance, but if you tested it in both directions, you'll get very similar um, results. Now, this is probably not, there are probably examples where this isn't true, um, but in our experience, that is something people are more worried about than they need to be. Counter example, or unlike, let's say, screw pattern, screw spacing, people are far less worried about that than they should be. Um, you also may have with um, in the field, so in the lab I said it may not matter so much, but in the field it might matter if you're exposing yourself to more flanking pads um, by putting the RC on the receive side, if that makes sense. By putting it on the source side you may prevent energy from getting in the building structure um, which could flank around the wall, so it may matter more in the field. Uh, but yeah, we we typically put those types of treatments on the source side as the best case scenario. So let's do an example of a skiff. So in this example, we're going to say that only, and this is 100% fictional, um, not real data. Don't worry, I'm not giving away uh, state secrets. Uh, but in this example, we'll say that this briefing room is the skiff and that the customer wants to achieve sound group four across the um, four brief this briefing room to evaluate that in the field what well, would we'll take one step back so in order to achieve this sound group four they needed to design such that the doors and walls floor ceiling etc all paths are able to achieve stc 50. So in the field, um, we have the requirement of NIC 45. In order to test this, we have to actually look at the relationship of the briefing room to all the adjacent spaces. So there are actually eight tests that are needed to evaluate one room. So we have the briefing room as the source room, and then all these other spaces as the receive room. So the briefing room to the man trap, um, via the door, but also remember via the walls and floors and all those unintended paths. And then the two offices, the hallway to the south, 
the adjacent space to the east, the adjacent space to the west, and even the basement below, and then the second floor above. So in this um, fictional example, we have a set of NIC ratings for each. Each of those configurations was tested, eight tests, and the resulting NIC ratings. You see they passed to the man trap, though just barely. Um, they got lucky that day that the rounding went in their favor. Um, so um, they just passed there, some group three and four, but the, the contractor used slightly lighter doors in the off in the two offices and they actually failed sound group four but passed sound group three fortunately all of the other critical paths um, to the hallways and adjacent spaces pass with flying colors so at this point the administrative officer will decide you know is this acceptable We've seen that. We've seen that where they may come back and say, you know, in hindsight, this space is closed off and we'll just control occupancy in these offices during meetings, and that was acceptable. Um, they may, since it's very close, they may use, choose to use a sound masking system in these offices and then evaluate that through non-instrumented uh, tests, basically listening tests. Um, they may say it's not good enough and they, contractor needs to put different doors in. So um, we've seen all three of those examples. Okay, so that is an overview of lab testing, field testing, some um, ASTM standard information, and then also some of my own personal opinions. Um, feel free to reach out to us. If you have any questions, you could use this email here, info at riverbankacoustics.com. Let me know how we can help in the future. All right. Any so, questions? Yeah, feel free to jump in with any questions before we close. How does door insertion loss compare to NIC? Mm. Well, yeah, so that standard was developed to attempt to focus more clearly on or focus more on the door itself and reduce the paths through on the walls for um, for the field test. Now it, it's important to note that the method by putting the microphones closer to the door, um, it does tend to be more influenced by sound near the door, but it could you're not eliminating flanking paths. You may still see um, you may still see some influence from flanking paths depending like like example, a very high performing door, but terrible flanking path. You know, you may still not be limited by the door, but that that standard was an attempt to get closer to the door to focus more on the door. We see it a lot less um, that, that requested than E336, but in like the example of this skiff, you know, the 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 customer is not just concerned with the door; they want the entire sound insulation between these two spaces. Now, the door manufacturer may go back and try to do a door insertion loss test to see if it was close, you know, if, if that improved it. But the, st the standard is currently written in NIC. Um, is there anything you have found that greatly impacts floor assembly ratings, flooring thickness, adhesive versus underlayment, concrete slab thickness, six inches versus eight inches, et cetera? Yes. All, all of these things. So um, floor ceiling assemblies, um, you we typically test for both the sound transmission class, that's the airborne sound transmission, and then the impact insulation class, the IIC. So two different classifications, airborne and impact. And we're typically testing both of those for floor ceiling assembly. Um, they're very much diff affected by different things. Um, so, for example, putting carpeting on almost any floor ceiling assembly will give you an off-the-charts good IIC rating, like thick carpeting and a pad, um, but only has a minimum, a minimal effect on the airborne transmission. So it greatly reduces impact sound, footfall noise, but has a minimal impact on airborne sound. <coughs> Whereas um, the mass of something like a concrete slab, a six inch or eight inch concrete slab, 
just the mass of it makes that slab, even the bare slab, um, pass building code requirements for airborne, but fail miserably for impact. So, so that subfloor condition um, makes a big difference on both um, airborne and impact testing. The challenge is that the IIC ratings are commonly used for selling things like floor coverings. Um, and the test is not just a floor covering, it's a test on a whole assembly. I've been using the example of like miles per gallon for tires. So miles per gallon is a good um, way to measure the fuel economy of a car. Um, and the tires heavily influence that. Um, right, like if you had off-road tires on a pickup truck, you'll know that the gas mileage decreases versus very smooth, hard, flat tires, um, the gas mileage increases. So if you were trying to sell tires based on miles per gallon, that would be a real tricky thing to do. So do you do you sell that you have um, 50 miles per gallon tires? Well, that could actually be a lie. Um, depending on how you qualify that. You could say these tires have been tested to 50 miles per gallon on a Prius and then that would um, that would be accurate. But if you sold them to someone who drove a Ford F-150 and you promised 50 miles per gallon, they might not be too happy. So that subfloor condition matters a lot. And then even the floor covering above, let's say an underlayment can matter quite a bit. So um, there's sort of best case and worst case scenarios, right? Like the carpet was the absolute best case scenario for floor covering for impact sound transmission. And then the um, maybe the worst case is a really heavy um, marble tile or something like that. Um, so tile tends to be closer to the worst case or harder to achieve bigger IIC numbers. Now there are products that, that can do that, but um, it gets more difficult with the harder floor covering. Now, something like vinyl tile is being a little bit softer, can be easier to get bigger numbers, bigger IIC numbers with a vinyl tile because it's a softer surface. So yeah, all these things can influence the performance. A lot of the, the, you know, the standard was written around this, uh, maybe the, an assumption that, that you could get test data for your floor ceiling assembly with the floor covered that they want in place. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very difficult if you have a unique construction. Okay, so there's uh, one more question. Does sound absorption material have any impact on sound transmission loss at all? Good question. Um, in the acoustics, business we're so used to a very like a very common misconception I just say like the bread crumbs lead you down the wrong path where like if there's a product that has a high NRC or high sound absorption um, there's people will assume that people are untrained or just learning about acoustics or this is their first time having to think about acoustics um, they will think that it the high NRC will help them to block sound from their neighbor um, so in the acoustic expertise arena, we're so used to that we like just tell people no, NRC and SCC are completely different things and they have nothing to do with each other. And if your concern is sound transmission through the wall, you only care about STC. And if your problem is echo and reverberation within a space, you only care about NRC. And it's it's safer to be that black and white so that people don't. Um, Come to the wrong conclusion. However, there is a little bit of overlap. So, for example, we mentioned in the field test before um, that the with the NIC not correcting for absorption, you could by having a lot of absorption in your receiver room, you may reduce sound levels slightly. So that might, in some situations, result in a quieter environment. Quieter environments sometimes also make you more aware of sounds. So like um, I think I've heard of the electric car industry dealing with this problem when they eliminated engine noise. Now everybody's concerned about the sound of the air over the mirror, for example, the outside mirror. So anyway, 
Um, but the the sound absorption on the surface of the wall can have a, some influence on the STC if it covers the entire wall. And it, and it tends to have more influence at higher frequencies than lower. But it's not the right tool to solve that problem, if that makes sense. It's a different tool for a different problem. Um, however, sound absorption in a wall cavity, so like we mentioned like bat insulation or mineral fiber, cotton, um, any of these types of insulation inside the wall cavity do help the STC because they're preventing that resonance inside the cavity. Well, thank you everyone and um, stay tuned uh, for the next uh, webinar.